Hello everyone, Grandma here. Grandpa and I are going to take a trip to the Long Island Fair. This is one of our favorite fall traditions. The Long Island Fair has been a part of Long Island history for 180 years. It has been held annually since 1842. Since 1970, it has been a recreation of a 19th century country fair. It's held at Old Beth Page Village Restoration, which is a living history park and museum with historic buildings dating back to 1765, which you can visit and tour. There will be plenty of food available to purchase there, but we thought it would be nice if we took some historically appropriate snacks with us. There are several recipes from Old Bethpage Village featured in this cookbook. Recipes from America's Restored Villages. I am going to be making the recipe for brick oven ginger cookies. These historically appropriate cookies used to be made at the Powell House every day by living history actresses wearing 19th century calico farm dresses. The cookies were passed out to school children touring the village. Today we are making them to bring with us. The ingredients are 3 fourths cup butter, 1 cup sugar, one fourth cup molasses, one egg, two cups sifted flour, two teaspoons baking soda, one teaspoon ground ginger, one teaspoon ground cinnamon. The first thing we have to do to make the ginger cookies is cream the butter with the sugar. Uh, just going to break this apart. We're doing this by hand with a wooden spoon because this is how they would have done it years ago. They didn't have the electric mixers. Okay. I'll put the sugar in and then I'm going to cream it all together. This will take a little bit of time. Be good. The butter is starting to soften more. It's getting better. Easier to cream it. So you can see how good it's. The butter and the sugar is together now. So now I'm going to be adding my molasses. Seems to be stirred well now. So now I'll be adding the egg in. And now I have to beat the egg in. So you have to stir it well until the egg is all incorporated. That is good now. That looks good. So this is done now and we're just going to set it aside. We're sifting the flour now and this is the old-fashioned way using my strainer to do the sifting. We're doing a little at a time. This is the rest of the flour now. Well, the, 
flour is all sifted. Now I'm going to add the baking soda. The ginger. And now the cinnamon. Oh, it smells so good with these spices. Okay, and now I will be stirring this all together. It's been all incorporated and now it's ready to be put into the butter, sugar, and molasses, an egg mixture. Now I'm going to stir the flour into the sugar, butter, molasses, and egg mixture. I'm going to stir this well. And this is how easy it is to make these ginger cookies. Very simple. And it smells so good. I wish everyone could smell how good this smells. This cookie batter smells so good. You could really smell the ginger and the molasses. dough is all done and I have to chill it for about an hour because they said chill it till you could handle it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in my smaller bowl because this will fit better in my refrigerator. So I'm just going to put this, cover this, put it in the refrigerator for about an hour, they said, till you could handle the dough better. And that's all it is to make these cookies. Very simple. The cookie dough is all ready to be put into the refrigerator. So I'll be back in about an hour. After, like I said, it's chilled for an hour, you just pinch some off and roll it into a ball. And then you roll it in some uh, granulated sugar. And then you put it on the, I'm using parchment paper on my baking sheet. Mmm, smells so good. And that's how easy it is. Now they say that as they bake, they're going to flatten. So as you can see, I'm almost done with this uh, tray, this cookie tray, Putting, rolling the last one in the sugar. And now they have to go in a 350 oven for 12 to 15 minutes so they get a little uh, golden brown. The cookies are now in the oven and I'm going to set the timer for 15 minutes. It's been 15 minutes and I just took them out of the oven. And as you can see, they flattened out and they look very good. So now I'll continue on to make more. The second batch is out of the oven and they really look good too. This is the last of the cookie dough. So I thought, let's get a little fancy and use sprinkles instead of granulated sugar and see how they turn out. Putting them in the sprinkles now. We'll just see how they turn out. How we like them with some sprinkles on them. Well, they look cute with the sprinkles. And these are white, like white sprinkles. These will go in the oven and this is the last batch. The last batch just came out of the oven and these are the ones that I put the sprinkles all around. 
The cookies are all done now and they look delicious. I made three dozen. Now I have my two sheets of wax paper and I'll be taking four cookies each and now we're wrapping them up in the wax paper to take with us to the fair and then I'm putting them in a paper bag and we'll be all ready to go. So this will be a nice snack at the fair that Grandpa and I will have. All done. Ready to go. We got here nice and early before the crowds. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to the Long Island Fair. We have a magic show starting in just a few moments. Make your way over and grab yourself a seat. Snakes are slimy, right? You hear that all the time. But they're always dry. They're just really smooth animals. She's a sweetheart. I know, I have more. I've worked with this animal since she was a baby. And the reason why she'll kind of flinch when I pet her, they can't see very well. They're, they're almost blind. So a lot of times if you walk in your backyard and they open their mouth at you, they're not saying, hey, I'm definitely going to bite you. They're saying, hey, these are my teeth. Please leave me alone because I have really powerful, sharp teeth. If you if you keep pushing me, yes, I will bite you. But that's not their automatic reaction. They prefer to play dead. They'd much rather run away. They don't want a problem with people. But uh, so when they, so the reason why they flinch all the time is because they can't really see too well. So when you spook them, they're going to open their mouth. They're not trying to scare you. They just can't see you.
much time do you t uh, typically have to form it before it starts getting uh -oh. non pliable? Uh, five or ten minutes. I usually don't need that long. This part is the part that goes pretty quickly. Cool yep. Now, all I'm doing at this stage, well, two things. First of all, the most important thing right now is I've got the top of the felt into the top of the, top of the block into the top of the felt. Got that nice and smooth. And I'm using a foot toliker to work the hot wet felt down onto the block as much as possible. That just the closer I can get this to fit the block at this stage, the less work I have to do later. Right. You'll also notice that as I'm working it, that the rest of the felt is curling up and a little rumply. That will become the brim of the hat, but eventually, so eventually I'm going to have to get it flat. Okay. okay. That's about as much as I can do with that right now. Now this is called the Commander. It's a really very complicated high-tech tool. Looks it. Yeah. It's a piece of cotton cord tied in a loop with a slip knot. Now I will put this up here well, most near the top. Know how to do that. <laughs> Sorry? I said most people nowadays wouldn't even know how to make that knot. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing fancy. Get this nice and snug. Okay. Pull it tight. Work it with a tool called a runner down. Really creative names here. No, it's very descriptive. The other tools that I use are called tollickers. I don't know quite where that word comes from, though I suspect the French. What do you do with the hats after you make them? We sell them. farmhouse where they used to hand out the cookies. This is all original and this was the Powell farm. All the buildings here are original. I wonder how old this picnic table is. Here's some peanuts we bought and here's the cookies. So now grandpa and I are going to have a snack. what they would have had for a snack peanuts and ginger cookies how's it taste grandpa they're good i like the spicy ginger flavor
So today I am making spoons mostly. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm just shining something up. Um, this is a 1740 to 60. It's hard to date these exactly. It's a spoon mold. And mm -hmm. as you can see, inside is a spoon. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I heat this up, close it up. I, I put um, soot from a candle. I, I heat it with a candle. And the soot coats the metal so one metal doesn't stick to another. And then I use a lay iron ladle and I pour in molten pewter and out comes a thing that looks like this. Yeah. That's called a sprue and this extra step here is flashing. I have to take that off and finish it and I end up with a spoon that you can actually use. Oh, nice. it, it takes you a while. You grind that to... off or you file it? I'm sorry? You grind that off? You're filing. filing. I'm filing it and I use uh, sandpaper. Now yeah. in the old days they didn't have sandpaper. Paper was very expensive. Yeah. So they would take the sand and mix it with water, put it on a rag. I do that here, I'll get, get it all over the place. So I'm using sandpaper. This is and this is a small spoon. I got the original and made a plaster mold. So I have two pieces of plaster, put the spoon in between the two layers and separated it. And there you can see the impression of the spoon. It comes out looking like this with a button and a screw on it. And then I cut off everything that doesn't belong, shine it up a little bit. And this would be a wig powder. Boom. You know those white wigs they were wearing? Mm -hmm. When you went to the powder room, it was to powder your wig with arsenic. Oh, oh my It was a white powder and it kept the bugs from growing in the wig. That's where the powder room got its name. And I figured this would probably be good for mustard or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody uses arsenic powder anymore, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> It dates from 1845. The building is a little older and it was used for other purposes later on, but it was a school in 1845 and that's how we've restored it to that appearance. Um, in 1845, New York State had a law that said that every town had to build a school. And the state partially funded that and it partially came out of local property taxes and so on. So here, every town had to have a school. But there was no law that said that children had to go to school, okay? That wasn't passed until the 1890s. So you have this time period where every town had to have a school, but children had, didn't have to go to school. So think about that for a second. It's, it means you didn't need a terribly big school. One building, one building was sufficient for the town. Uh, when you get inside, you'll see that there's room for maybe 30 or 40 children, but it was never filled. It was never filled. It was, children came to school only when their parents had nothing for them to do at home. And home was usually a farm. This was mainly farmland in those days. All right. um, anyway, come on in and I'll tell you more inside.